All right. Welcome, everyone. That was great. Did you enjoy that? <laughs> OK, so uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about SDN at 10. And uh, it's, it's hard for me to believe, personally, that SDN is 10 years old. Uh, we're going to take a look at the past and the present and where SDN is headed. So we have a great panel here, and uh, it should be a lot of fun. So um, Nick, I'm going to start with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe you could share with the audience, um, how did SDN get started? And, and where did that term even come from? You know, you've got to be careful asking a professor an open-ended question like that, because I could talk for hours. Uh, <laughs> but um, you know, it, when thinking about where SDN came from, <clears throat> It's useful to think about what networking was like in 2008. Uh, if you wanted to build a network, you had to build it from the same equipment that everybody else had. You had to use the same equipment that was provided by all the switch and router vendors. They were closed, proprietary, vertically integrated. The features were baked in from the beginning. Everybody had to deal with the same thing. Network management was a dirty word. If you wanted to manage a network of switches, you had to write your own scripts over a lousy, cruddy C CLI. And everybody had their own way of doing it in order to try and make their network different from everybody else's. And the equipment vendors had no incentive to help you to do that, because they wanted all the intelligence inside the box. Because that's how they could extract the most margins from the equipment that they were selling. This is not a cynical view. That's actually the right business practice for them to do. But for the internet, this had a stagnating effect. For anyone trying to build a network, it made it really hard to do what you wanted. So the term, the internet has ossified, came about largely from Guru and from a few others who were pointing out that the network was unable to change. And so as researchers, we really wanted to try and figure out, and this started as a research project. It was how do you introduce change and innovation into the network? At Stanford, we started a thing called the Clean Slate Program. And uh, that was back in about 2006, 2007. And there was a PhD student in that group called Martin Casado. And Martin had this idea, which was, hey, why don't we rebuild the Stanford network, <clears throat> just slightly bold thought, uh, out of switches and access points that we'll build ourselves. We're going to replace the 2,000 switches that we had in wiring closets. Every one of them had a CPU on it. So there were 200 system administrators, 2,000 CPUs to control Stanford's network. Martin just simply showed that if you lift the control up and out of the switches up into servers, you could replace the 2,000 CPUs with one CPU centrally managed. And it would perform exactly how you wanted, be administered by about 10 people instead of 200. And you could implement the policies of a large institution directly in one place centrally administered. So we went to talk to a bunch of vendors and said, hey, this seems like a good idea. We put all of our work into the public domain. Why don't you take this idea and run with it? So they got really angry. <laughs> they got redder and redder and redder. And we were like, this is really strange. We seem to have touched a raw nerve here. We got out into the parking lot and said, OK, we better double down on this effort. So we went back. We tripled the size of the research program. The Clean Slate program was started. And then an interview a few weeks later, Kate Green of MIT Technology Review coined the term software-defined networking. And in fact, I have the original paper right here. So there is oh. the paper. It was called Ethane, right? Um, That's right. Authored by Martin and, and yourself and, uh, and Scott Shankar. Shankar. And, uh -huh. yep. Second paper, Open Flow, that was authored exactly 10 years ago, April of 2008. And there's the paper that Nick just referred to, which is the MIT review paper on software-defined networking. And there you go. If you didn't know that before, that's mm -hmm. how the concept of SDN mm -hmm. was born. So um, uh, quite a, a journey, definitely, in terms of how that came about. Um, Guru, I want to ask you, uh, I remember reading the paper on OpenFlow, um, and it was just mind-blowing when I read it. It was, um, you know, it was new, it was disruptive, it stirred a whole debate in the networking industry on, uh, on OpenFlow and the architecture that it brought about. Could you share with the audience what inspired you to come up with the concept of OpenFlow, and um, you know, what, what was the you know, sort of thinking behind how that came about? So I guess how we came up with the concept, I think lion's share of credit probably goes to Nick and Martin and Scott. 
Uh, but in terms of, as Nick mentioned, that in 2006, 2007 timeframe, the research community was feeling as if that they, the internet was ossified and their ability to make an impact on internet was very limited. Uh, they were not succeeding in being able to bring about a new capability, the new features and functionality to internet. It was becoming harder and harder. And actually in the research community, we had tried out different ideas in terms of how we can enable and empower the research community to do this. And then the simple idea, what seemed like a very simple idea to just separate the control plane from the forwarding plane, define a protocol that is open flow, and then be able to uh, enable research community to build new capabilities and functionality on top of that control plane, uh, kind of came about and uh, caught attention of the research community and made it very, very easy for the research community to innovate. And interestingly at the time, uh, that number of vendors uh, agreed to put open flow on their boxes, open flow agents on their boxes. So very quickly, uh, we were able to get um, switches the routers that were open flow enabled. And then Nicera and uh, Stanford um, created this open source controller, the first generation, uh, Knox and uh, Beacon and all of that, and they were distributed uh, to the research community. And um, it really caught the imagination of the community and then they were able to create lots of very interesting capabilities on those simple controllers and show that you could uh, kind of uh, bring new capabilities. There was one more idea that came about right after OpenFlow and that was this idea of Flowizer that the idea was that you can slice a production network using OpenFlow and a simple piece of software. And then with slices, in one slice you could run production network and then another slices, you could run experimental network and show the new capabilities. And again, in the research community, that idea of network slicing and Flowizer got uh, immediate attention. And then we were able to deploy OpenFlow enabled networks on many campuses around the world. And they were able to do experimentation on production network uh, with slicing. Now, it is too bad that uh, that particular concept hasn't really caught on. In the, in the industry as much as yet. But if you go back and look at the history of OpenFlow and Flowizer and all of that, all of that happened in something like 2000, I mean late, to, uh, you know, from 2007 to 2010, 2011 timeframe. And there were at least 15, uh, 50 or more institutions that were running OpenFlow with Flowizer, slicing and demonstrating production traffic and experimental research traffic running side by side on the same infrastructure and how innovations can happen. Um, uh, hopefully industry will catch on more and uh, put some of these ideas into practice. I hope that answers. Uh, that's great, yeah. So um, the notion of disaggregating the control plane and the data plane, I think brought about a whole new way of networking which is running software on uh, x86 uh, hosts. Um, I want to ask Chris this question because I, I found the intersection of open source and SDN um, somewhat, uh, you know, was happening in parallel, but then it started to intersect as networking became open and developers started joining the movement and, you know, look at how to uh, make these uh, composable VNFs and sort of decompose the whole notion of a monolithic, you know, router and, and switch. So I wanted to ask you, how did you see those two movements sort of come together? And, uh, was that a perfect storm that, you know, SDN was, was happening on the networking side and while on the cloud side, you know, there was this whole open source movement and the developers sort of came together around that? Well, it starts with some practical issues, right? Engineers, you're trying to solve real problems. And the, the confluence of events that I think was interesting was you, on the one hand, we had academic community producing a mechanism for creating programmable networks that we hadn't always had. So, when Nick was describing the um, CLI managed network infrastructure and how antiquated that is, I was thinking that sounds suspiciously like the network infrastructure that we're managing today. Um, <laughs> however, building all of this new virtualization uh, technology and bringing it into, into enterprises and, and to, the, to the world at large created a need for a type of network programmability that I think was happening at the same time as the mm -hmm. research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so having tools like uh, open source tools, like, like Open vSwitch being a, a great example, mm -hmm. having those tools available so that we could build the type of network topologies that we, we needed in virtualization 
taking advantage of the underlying concepts, not flow visor concepts and not doing experimental um, networking protocol research, but actually just trying to connect applications to each other and to the rest of the network became a really practical application of, of interesting academic research. And you know, in the beginning, so much hype about SDN and disaggregation, and, and it's all about open flow. And one of the things that I always wanted to say is it, it's, it's not about open flow. It's not about a protocol. It's about a concept. And the concept is about programmability of the network. And open source is a great way to help develop skills and advance the industry with, with a, a lot of collaborative effort. Um, so taking some core tenants from research, creating open source projects for people to collaborate around and solve real engineering problems for themselves, I think was that confluence of events. And so to me, it's a little bit of the virtualization, a little bit of, of academic research coming together at just the right time, and Absolutely. then accelerated with, with <clears throat> open source code that we can collaborate on. Yeah, and I think it's uh, really helping the networking industry drive a whole new wave of innovation. Because uh, I think it opened it up to a huge community of developers with new ideas. And, um, and uh, literally, with the cloud, anyone can now uh, get some compute resources and start developing um, you know, networking applications, uh, et cetera. Um, I want to kind of take a look at where SDN is today. And um, there are a lot of networking um, open source uh, communities out there now. And um, you know, their service providers are you know, essentially reinventing their network. And the traditional sort of pop and central office um, architecture is completely being transformed. So uh, maybe, Guru, you could um, talk a little bit about how that transformation and where it is today. I know you're running the CORD initiative, and there's a lot of transformation happening in the sort of the very um, you know, uh, traditional central office space. Uh, you know, where is that initiative today, and how do you see that industry transforming? Okay, so uh, thank you for asking the question. As uh, some of you may know, COD is my favorite topic these days to talk about, so I'm uh, happy to talk about that. But before I get into that, I also want to acknowledge, uh, especially AT&T and two gentlemen from AT&T. One I can see, Al Blackburn and Tom Anschutz who kind of brought that focus on central offices. I still remember Al sat me down in one of the conferences and said, it is a stupid central office. I mean, right, he was saying that focus your attention on central office because that is where uh, service providers uh, spend most of their capex and opex on, and that is what needs to be reinvented. And he and Tom Anschutz are the people who basically asked us the following question, that if we were to do central offices again, clean slate, how would we do that? Or another way to pose that question is, if the cloud people were doing central offices, that is Google, Amazon, or someone, how would they build their central offices? And that is what got us down the path of doing COD. Uh, now, yes, COD has gone tremendous traction. There are 20 plus providers around the world that are deploying uh, COD in the uh, lab settings. Some of them want to do field trials and production deployments uh, as well. And you may ask, why is that the case that all these operators um, kind of COD has captured the imagination of these operators. And I think the answer is pretty straightforward. We all know that operators are wanting to rebuild the network edge because 5G is coming. Many operators want to do gigabit plus broadband access to their uh, residential customers. Okay, And then the edge is where they can innovate new services and revenue generating services to be able to take advantage of 5G, take advantage of gigabit plus broadband access, and so on. And the central offices are very, very old. And so building this new edge is almost mandatory, as well as what they want to do. And now when they want to think about building this new network edge, obviously they want to do it with this new software-defined networking, open source. They want to do it with disaggregation. Uh, uh, white boxes and all of that. That is how they want to do build the new network edge. They don't want to do it the old-fashioned way. And what COD has done is to bring all of this thing together in a single platform or a solution where you can support gigabit broadband access using merchant silicon, white boxes, open source. You can try to support disaggregated radios uh, with XRAN and XRAN controller. You can do disaggregation of EPC and virtualize EPC. And COD brings all of this thing together in a single platform uh, that one could deploy. And that is one of the reasons we are seeing a lot of interest. Uh, that it is bringing all of these ideas into a single uh, platform. And hopefully it will continue. 
Yeah, so I, I think the, uh, the concept of disaggregation is being applied everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, central office, POPs, data centers. Um, and there are multiple abstraction layers now that are getting formed and um, you know, looking at essentially how to provide a simpler interface mm -hmm. to developers. Um, I want to ask you, Nick, with the P4 initiative that you're driving, how is that abstraction layer with the P4 programmable language really changing the, um, the packet forwarding engine? So I think it's worth to, <clears throat> to think about the following question. You know, why is it that it takes so long for networking equipment to add a new feature? When VXLAN was first defined by uh, VMware and Cisco in 2010, it was four years before that feature showed up in silicon. It's because we've got used to the idea that silicon is fixed function. If you can take those things which are fixed in silicon and lift them up and out, the protocols and features, so that they're defined in software, then software developers will add ideas that we had never thought of about how to simplify, improve, make more reliable, make more secure the network that they're running. Today, network behavior, the way in which packets flow through a network, are determined by chip designers. And chip designers don't operate big networks. So a few of us got together in about 2013 from Google and Microsoft, Intel, Barefoot, and a few others to, um, to try and figure out, could you define a language, which ended up being called P4, for defining the forwarding behavior of packets in a network? We had this sense that SDN had made the, put the control plane in the hands of those who own and operate networks. How could you put the forwarding behavior in their hands too? How could you make it so that somebody could change the behavior of the way that packets were processed? Because if you can't change the way that packets are processed, you're not really in control of the network. Because all the network does is pass packets around, really, at the end of the day, that's all it does. It passes packets around and processes them a little bit as they go by. If you can't change the behavior, then you're not in control. So the P4 language was designed to allow that lifting up and out so that other people, the software developers, some people refer to it as a, as a Cambrian explosion that you would expect to take place. That doesn't mean that everything gets far more complicated. In many cases, people will use it to reduce the complexity down to what they actually need. So how do you see, let's switch gears and move to the future. How do you see, um, you know, with these different initiatives that are happening, you know, mm -hmm. Cord and uh, P4 programmable language, providing that abstraction layer that makes it even easier, um, how is that going to shape the future of SDN? What are your thoughts on that? So what it takes is for a community effort to pile on and be in, involved. So with P4.org, there's 100 companies that, that, that are members of that. That, that, that organization contributing code, modifying the behavior of their networks, contributing tools and compilers and things like that. For Cord, there are many operators that are deploying it. So as we have this community growing, then there is a, there's a little bit of a risk of fragmentation as we all go off in different directions. And so finding a balance, and we all have a common interest here, which is to create production quality software from ODL, from ONOS, from CORD, from P4, from all of these different, these different efforts, so that we can all take charge of the networks that we own and operate. And so it will be, it'll come from that need and from that need from the community. In an environment where we can create lots of new ideas, we've got to be careful that we don't become too attached to those ideas because that's where the fragmentation comes from. So we need to find that right balance. So working together in that ecosystem in a meritocratous way where we share openly the ideas that we have, I think that's what will give us a path to much more open source use in our network that we share as an ecosystem. All right, so, um, so Chris, a question for you, as Nick was talking about um, the you know, notion just having more control of the data plane, the forwarding plane. Um, there's a notion out there that there is uh, this intent-based you know, networking concept. Um, and you know, I wanted to ask you, how, how is intent-based networking, um, you know, really help uh, developers, operators, um, to have better control of the, the packet forwarding, the policy engine, and, you know, how does that come together? So everything can be solved with another layer of abstraction, and intent-based <laughs> networking is, in, is intending to create a, a higher level abstraction so that you can define your goals in a language that's relatively simple, divorced from the underlying implementation details. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that it's a very powerful concept. 
like anything else, you, we, we always have to kind of distinguish between the excitement and the hype and the reality. Uh, but policy-based management, not even network specific, but policy-based management is absolutely a thrust in the industry because what we're doing is continuing to build more and more complex systems. Complexity uh, needs some level of abstraction to help operators manage the complexity. Otherwise, you're going to drown in, in, in all of the details. So intent-based networking is, is an example of that. You know, bring, bring the abstraction layer a level higher. Use something that's uh, declarative. Describe your intents, not describe the details of IP addresses and, and um, ports and ACLs and all the kind of header level details. Yeah. It's an important step, uh, but I, I think the, the overall picture here is we're trying to build next generation networks. At one level, I think we're trying to, to really simplify the fabric and maybe move complexity into software where we can move, manage that complexity uh, a little bit more rapidly because hardware does have some life cycle limitations, mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, find enough commonality that we don't create a new set of complications for ourselves as an industry. If you look back at the evolution of, of networking, we've had a proliferation of standards. There's a lot of ways to do similar things, and we're, we're, we're going to do something similar in open source communities. We'll develop a lot of ways to do, do similar things, and I think what's challenging for us as, as a broad industry is finding the best of breed ways to do that and, and really accelerating those as core focus areas, including the software for the industry, uh, so that we don't create fragmentation. And, and you know, part of that fragmentation is a lack of interoperability, but part of that fragmentation is just focus. Mm -hmm. And we have finite resources across the industry, both from an operations side and a developer side. And there's a tension between innovation and kind of uh, contraction that, that mm -hmm. brings focus on, on a a smaller set of projects. So kind of an exciting time for me in, in that sense, but it is hard to figure out how to work together as broad co like communities across these different projects and find whether it's intent-based or whether it's you know, some, some next AI-driven <laughs> autonomous networks. Um, you know, all these concepts are really exciting, but finding the key ones that we can focus on together, I think, is where the real power and benefit will come from. Yeah, I do think that uh, unification is very critical for um, the networking community to scale and drive even more innovation. Um, it's, it's interesting, there's that trend of, you know, the community sort of, you know, created all these different open source projects and, you know, there were a lot of ideas, um, ODL and OPNV and uh, ONAS, and there were a lot of these projects and somehow I think uh, it's coming back together again. And uh, there's unification, not only at the organizational sort of community level, but also at the technology level, as some of these abstraction layers are coming together. I think this conference um, has been exciting because there's a lot of talk about AI and um, you know, the convergence of these technologies are kind of coming together. Um, Guru, I want to ask you, you know, looking forward, um, you know, SDN in the next 10 years, um, <laughs> <laughs> if, if you have your, your crystal ball, what would you say about you know, some of the emerging things that you see today, and how is that going to change the direction of SDN in the next 10 years? As you know, in the, I think in the technology sector, making predictions is not a wise thing to do. So I think uh, I wouldn't want to uh, give you any predictions of that type. But I think uh, general trends, I think that are, um, so I think that are, you can look at technology trends and where are the areas where they would get applied. So I mean, I think, uh, as I was saying earlier, that uh, edge is definitely uh, not because of card, but in general. I would think that in the service provider industry, the edge of the network will definitely go through a major transformation. And, and I think uh, uh, it is uh, pretty clear uh, that uh, when that edge transformation happens, uh, we will be leveraging SDN, disaggregation, white boxes, open source, and all of that. And I think that will, uh, uh, you know, will def I mean, I think all the trends suggest that that is, you know, we are on a path to doing that and that will uh, happen in that uh, space. Um, I'm also, I mean, I think Chris alluded to uh, this to some extent. I think the, if you still go back and look at some of the early papers on SDN, uh, I personally think that we still have ways to go to realize the full potential of SDN because uh, what was uh, conceived, um, even early uh, papers of SDN, is that through this logical centralization of the control plane and the configuration, you have a global view that represents forwarding state, 
performance state and configuration state. And once you bring all of that state at one low place, then there are many, many opportunities to do things in terms of network verification, network debugging, uh, kind of change management, how you do it, uh, the kinds of things that the intent-based networking. And so all of this software stack and tool chain that can be built on top of that logically centralized control plane, all that work is still needs to be done. Whether it is AI play the role in it and machine learning play the role in it, that is, uh, to me, is a secondary. But all that, um, you can say, exploitation of real FDN it still needs to be done, and I think it will be done. And um, I want to make this one last thing, that is, if you look at where Google is going, I know a lot of times we say Google is very different, but Google has already moved quite a bit in terms of logically centralized SDN control plane, and on top of that, building this tool chain that is helping them get both agility as well as very high availability of their infrastructure. So they talk about being able to do changes maybe once a day or a few times in a week, and at the same time making sure nothing is breaking in their network, and that is because of the fact that they are exploiting some of these SDN capabilities. And I hope the rest of the industry will do the same going forward. Great. So uh, we have just about three minutes left. Um, I want to just uh, ask the panelists, this is probably a question in the audience minds as well. Uh, we have a community of uh, operators, um, you know, open source developers, uh, end users, you know, people who deploy networks out there. Um, any sort of um, you know, recommendations uh, in how they could contribute towards the growth of open networking? Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, how can we collectively shape the direction of networking in the next 10 years? So maybe I'll start with you, Nick. So you know, this SDN is a bit of a funny name, <clears throat> software-defined networking. As Vince said, it's already defined in software. What is it actually about? Like nearly all disruptions in, in networking, this disruption is about moving who is in charge, moving who is in control. It's moving from the control being inside the box, closed and proprietary, into your hands as the network owner and operator. So that's the change that's actually going on. This change only actually happens if at the receiving end, there are people who are willing to learn about the open source, get involved in the ecosystem, contribute. That's how it, that change actually comes to fruition. So there's a handing over of the keys that's taking place and the keys have to be grabbed. And that takes a lot of time, a lot of commitment, a lot of effort. And that's what will actually bring this to fruition, whichever project it happens to be in, whichever part of the ecosystem that happens to be. Guru? Yes, I think I also like the Wint's answer to the question that Arpit posed him at the end. And for Wint to say the following, that now for this generation of people, there is another opportunity to recreate the internet I thought that was the most inspiring thing I have heard from somebody who is the father of internet. Mm -hmm. And so if that doesn't inspire you, mm -hmm. I don't know what can. So I think uh, I really feel that with either with because of SDN, because of disaggregation, because of open networking, for our generation, I'm get also getting old, but some of the, near, the younger people, this is your another opportunity and that comes once in lifetime where you have an opportunity to kind of reinvent the infrastructure of the society, the most important infrastructure of the society because of the changes that are happening. So I hope you will grab it and do exciting things with that. Chris? Well, starting point, I'll happily make a prediction. SDN at 20 will be really, really an open source movement. Uh, so to, to Nick's point, Getting involved is how you can manage influencing this direction. So I think SDN is about you know, un unlocking the potential of the network in the context of applications and, and users, not just the operators trying to connect two ends of uh, uh, two different separate endpoints. Getting involved, looking at how you change your own uh, mindset and skills because many of the operational practices that we see today in networks don't translate into kind of a, a software world where things move rapidly and we look at uh, being able to make small consistent incremental changes rather than big bang rollout changes. So getting involved and really being open to, to new techniques and new tools and new technologies I think is how together we can create the next generation, <laughs> the next, the new internet, internet Three, I guess, because we are. 
Sounds good. Um, I guess you know my my last word to everybody is that the community is extremely important, and uh, I thank all of you for your contributions. And regardless of what your role is, you may be a developer, uh, you might be an operator, you might be um, you know a, a tech writer. Um, there are many different ways to contribute to um, to the projects. So um, you know regardless uh, what your role is and which one of the open source networking. Uh, projects you're involved in, uh, continue to contribute. You know, we deeply appreciate it. You're making the difference, and uh, you are essentially shaping the future of SDN in the next 10 years. So uh, with that, I want to give everyone a, a huge round of thanks for being here and being part of the community. And uh, let's give a round of applause to our panelists. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.